And Maggie Gillis tells me it's the top of the hour, and welcome to Horde's Dairyman live stream. I'm glad to produce this third episode here. Corey Geiger, managing editor of Horde's Dairyman. We have four guests with us as we talk about tapping the brakes on milk flow. And we're excited to have Lala Man Animal Nutrition be our sponsor this week, our third program series. And as we went through, we always gather a day before and talk a little bit what we're going to go through here, but this is live broadcast right now. And I think uh, even though we're dealing with the COVID-19 situation here as it relates to dairy, there's a, a lot of optimism this time of year because it's spring planting. You've got leaves popping, you're putting seed in the ground, and if you're a farmer, you can't help but be optimistic about spring planting and what the year may hold. Uh, I always like to start out with a shout out here, and today's special shout out is to Indiana's Western Boone FFA. You know, we talked a lot about what some of the regional groups are doing, but your local FFA chapter, your 4 H club, or other youth group can do a lot of good things. That Indiana chapter set a goal of fundraising $20,000 because they flew past their $10,000 goal and they delivered 700 gallons of milk, 700 pounds of pork, and 700 pounds of beef to four area food shelters, and they're going to keep on doing that. So we have two special guests to our dairy live stream program. Before we introduce them, I'm going to call on Jim Boltz to load our, load our first poll question here. And that will set up our first guest commentator. And everybody can answer here. How much has your dairy processing plant or co-op asked your dairy farm, or if you're a, a consultant, how much they've asked the dairy farmers that you work with to cut back on milk shipments. So we got 0%, 1 to 5%, 6 to 10%, 11 to 15%, or more than 15%. So go ahead and submit your poll answers here, and they're coming in really strong. And we'll just wait a few more minutes here. We've got two categories that are running very hot here, the 0% category and then the 6 to 10% here. So when, poll, when Jim feels it's ready to Cut the pull off here, we will do that. And we got 40% of the votes are in here and we do need to vote fast so we can keep going here. So 28% said 0% and that was the second category. Six to 10% came in first at 30%. 11 to 15% was 27%. So we got three distinct categories uh, here. And we're gonna turn it over uh, to Jim Karzis, a senior, Extension Associate at Cornell University. Welcome to our dairy live stream conversation, Jason. Dairy farmers and their advisors are juggling a lot of issues on the dairy farm. What sage advice would you have for them right now as they try to navigate those situations? Thank you, Corey. That's a very good question. Honored to be invited to join Mark and Chris and Andy. I know is off this week uh, on this program. And just thought I would start off a little bit about just trying to remember some of our key farm management concepts from over the years. I mean, certainly today is unprecedented times for why we have to be making decisions and kind of the first time in my career that we're actually talking about plans to reduce milk production. But it's certainly not the first time that farms have had to make financial decisions during periods of financial stress with incomplete and uncertain information. So I think trying to, re trying to remember some of our key farm management concepts and decision-making processes as we roll ahead here is really, really critical. And to kind of start off on is making sure we take time for management decisions. And I like to talk about effective management time, that we actually need to be spending time, setting time aside to where we can work through decision-making processes because they're really trying to avoid making decisions in haste or decisions based off emotions, or decisions made at the spur of the moment. And how do we step back from that? Because when we think about our goals or our objectives during our decision making, and certainly here during financial stress or with this reduction in incentive programs or, or us being asked to reduce production, our goal is to minimize the negative impact on the business, to minimize loss, not to minimize cost. So sometimes those can be two different things. And again, how can we step back and spend time and, and set time aside that we can do that in a structured manner and when we're in a, and we have the right energy level and those types of things to try to do that. 
we have to make sure we have accrual based financial data. If we're going to be making financial decisions, if we're going to be doing budgeting, do we have accrual based or accrual adjusted financial statements, consolidated financial statements? Do we have an accurate picture of where our business has been for earnings, what our cost structure has been? Especially like, okay, what was our performance in 2019? What were our numbers like? Can we use that for the basis of our decision making? How can we use our farms data? And seeing this is on, I'm kind of from the financial side, so that's more specific to the financial numbers. And we have to put numbers to options. So again, I get questions like, all right, what should we do? What's our best option? And I'm not sure at this point there's an answer to that question versus what may make sense for my farm from all the various things that Dr. Hutchins might talk about here a little bit later, the different strategies that might be pursued to approach different things. But we have to put numbers to the options. We're gonna have incomplete information. There's a lot of unknowns, but we still have to put some numbers to it to help frame the conversation and help us identify what might be key things that we wanna focus on. And we need to compare alternatives. If we only ever analyze one option, what's the right answer? And I had a phone call this morning from a farm that was like, okay, this is what option we're considering doing. And it's like, well, what other things have you considered? Well, nothing. Okay, what's the right answer? If we only consider the one option, that is it. So then it's like, okay, what else could we do? What are some of the other things that we could talk about? Another one of our key farm management things, and some of these lessons are coming out of 09. For those that lived through 09 and then the 06 time frame and the 02 and 03 time frame and the 1997 time frame. And then maybe out of this group, it'll just be Mike and Mark, but they can remember 1985 time frame. <laughs> and what happened then? And, and I have a stack of magazines here, Farm Journal, not to put Corey in the wrong spot here, but it was just a series of articles on the lending crisis that was occurring in 1995. I'm sorry about that, Corey. But, uh, but again, some of that old reading where that was just right before the, my start of my career. So I was hearing about it two years or three years after the fact, but reading on some of those things. Use sounding boards. So who can I use as sounding boards to bounce ideas off of, whether it's your agri-service providers, your consultants, your lender, your accountant, other people? And with any of these decisions, what, how nimble are we? How flexible can we be? What's the exit strategy from these decisions? Again, not a new management concept, but how do we exit back out of these if the rules change? Here in the Northeast, there was plans put in place a year ago or six months ago or three months ago, and all those plans just changed here in the last two weeks. Okay, we're making decisions now. What if the plans change again in three months? What's our exit strategies? How flexible, how nimble we are? And do our sensitivity analysis on the budgeting side. We're gonna make our best assumptions we can, the best information you have. If, you, if you're not sure about something, ask your handler about what the reduction program entails. They might not know, but at least get questions to them. And then do your sensitivity analysis. What if we're off on this key assumption? What's that mean? So those are just some of the key things I wanted to at least start off with here and just some of the key farm management things when I think about the financial side, the budgeting side, decision-making side, and, and, and really, really important that we just don't make decisions in haste. That yes, May 1st, this is in place. That's true, but we don't necessarily need to have all our decisions made or all our decisions implemented by May 1st. Jason, I appreciate that. And I had a young dairy farmer call me last night. And as I talked on my cell phone on the porch, I presented some ideas that maybe weren't that exciting. But I think in these times, you really got to play a little bit devil's advocate on this as an advisor and that and say, have you considered this? Doesn't make it a winning idea, but give it some thought. We're going to do another poll question here. And if Jim Baltz can put that on the screen here in the audience, as soon as you see that, go ahead and start voting. If your dairy farm is being asked to reduce milk output, which management changes are you considering or enacting? You can click all that apply. If you think all five of them are, or four of the five are in there, go ahead and click that. Consultant, same thing here. What do you, what recommendations are you advising here? So uh, 
go ahead and vote. We got about 10% of the precincts have reported here. And uh, we're getting some very hot readings here. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Mike and Jason and Mark and Chris yesterday and Jim advised us to oh, give this for multiple options here because I think we're going to see some very impressive results here uh, that you're doing all the portfolio of things. So, Jim, when you think that we're at about 40% of the poll here, uh, so we'll wait a little bit more on that and just remind everybody that we're thankful for Lalamad to be sponsoring the program and can sponsorship here with Ford's Dairyman. This is our third dairy live stream broadcast and we're going to do this all next month through May here as we navigate the situation brought on by COVID-19. So we closed the polls here and uh, drying cows off early, 70%. Culling more heavily, 67%. Changing the ration, 63% dropping from 3x to 2x, 38%, and a group here not reducing production because uh, some of farms haven't been asked to reduce milk flow here. So with that, the legendary Mike Hutchins in Urbana, Illinois here. Mike, feed, feed rations are a big idea area. What are some of the options following up on Jason's minimizing loss, not minimizing cost? Yeah, I think uh, great, uh, a pleasure to be on your program here today. And, and Jason has really set the stage nicely. And the poll has been really revealing as well. Certainly, uh, I'm going to mention two, what I call the 2T philosophy. The first T is timeliness. And, and maybe our economists and Jason can answer the question, is this going to go on for three weeks, uh, three months, uh, six months, or for a year? That becomes very important what our strategy may be that we're going to run through here very, very quickly. My second T is targeting, simply saying, well, how much am I going to have to cut back? And we saw tremendous ranges in the survey question here, all the way from none to as high as greater than, than 20%. So once we're armed with that information, we can then look at some of the options here quickly. So for simplicity, I'm gonna use the average Holstein herd here in Illinois, 150 cows, yep, 150 cows, and they're averaging 70 pounds of milk. And I understand I have a baseline. That means I've gotta come up with about a, with a 10% cut, somewhere's about 1,000 pounds of milk a day I need to reduce coming off my farm if my uh, if that's being di dictated by, by my processor. Well, the simple, very simply it says you drop six pounds per cow, you're there. I'm not sure that's the right answer, but certainly uh, one approach that gets one number to think a little bit about. All of us online have to kind of sort through and say, what is my numbers going to look like on the 2T concept? So let's look at some of those options that uh, Corey's uh, poll question, Jim's poll question, look at. Uh, the, the first one is, is, is to cull cows. Uh, basically, they're gone. Uh, in other words, if they're getting 40 pounds of milk, that's 40 pounds of milk you no longer are going to ship. So that's the first question. And that is, I'm going to assume 40 pounds. So if I got 40 pounds of milk, I'm to, if that's my only strategy, and there are several other ones, I'm going to call about 17% of my cows. Now, the question is, what happens in three months from now, your co-op says, hey, we're, we're, we're business as usual. Restaurants are opening. Exports are up, uh, off and running. We're off and running. They're, they're gone. So the question is, do you have heifers on the farm to backstop this, or are you just going to buy some heifers, which are fairly economical right now? And uh, of course, uh, the, the question to remember about this, guys, if you've got uh, your farm uh, 10 heifers calving in the next month, you just added 10 more cows and they're going to probably give you 70, 80, 80 pounds of milk as well. Number two quick question would be, well, how, how about drying them off early? The good news there, cows are still there on the farm. And what do I mean by early? Well, we're saying instead of that typical 45, 50 day dry period, we may be talking 80 to 100 days as far as that goes. So if I dry my cows off at, uh, at uh, say 40 pounds again, th 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 there gives you your, your number, how many cows you're gonna have to dry off as well. Uh, one suggestion is if you're gonna put these cows, they're gonna be dry for maybe 80 to 100 days, uh, don't mess up your, your dry cow pens. In other words, uh, don't put them in with the other 40 uh, heifers, cows are gonna be uh, calving in the next 40 days. We would suggest putting them in a separate lot. And of course, spring is here now, we got pastures, dry lots, and now you can put a unique diet for them, fairly economical, don't need a lot of additives, may not need a lot of things besides forages out there and minerals out there in, in the feeding program. So that's another strategy. Another thought would be looking going from 3X to 2X. And again, uh, the Maryland data suggests you're gonna see anywhere from six to eight to nine pounds less milk, not a percentage, but pounds of milk. So again, you can do the math on that and figure out, well, how many cows would I have to go from 3X to 2X to accomplish that? And, and we're cautious on that one, primarily because I'm not gonna mess with my fresh cows. 
and my early lactation cows because they're the ones that make me the most money. They are the most efficient on the farm. I'm not going to handicap those cows. I have to have those cows ready to breed, uh, to stay healthy, to avoid any 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 challenges there in, in, in the program. So I'm a little cautious. You may want to look at going to 2X part of the herd, but how do you implement that, Jason, on a herd? Pretty tough if you're, if you're going to go 3X on, on a third of the herd and 2X on the other herd. Uh, all kinds of labor and milking machine uh, and parlor issues come there as well. Another choice is to institute a uh, second group. Now, many of my smaller farms, a one group TMR. And they're saying, if I get to a low group TMR, I put a third or half my cows in there. My cows are still there. The research says they may drop six to eight pounds of milk, depending on which uh, university you want to follow on that one there. But th you can see that's not going to solve all your problems as far as that goes. The last one that scares me, and that is this pullback on nutrients. We're going to pull all the feed additives out. We're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, uh, pull protein out. We're going to limit uh, energy in the feeding program. Uh, that one really scares me. And then the other one is you can feed it. And obviously, if you've got milk replacer going to your heifer calves, obviously, that's a very easy choice there. Second of all, you can take and feed it back to your cows. And we've done some pushing uh, on, on these numbers here. It looks like the sweet spot is about 16 pounds you could feed, ba uh, you, you could feed back. And in the TMR, maintaining a dry matter that's uh, hopefully going to be no no wetter than 60% moisture at this point. And there's lots of uh, protocols we can talk about in the Q&A on that. What's the value of those nutrients and that 16 pounds of milk? Well, I made some calculations over the weekend and said that's worth about $8 per hundredweight. And I look at the value of the protein, the fat, and the sugar that's in that milk. So, Corey, I think with that kind of sets the table to see if there's other follow-up questions. I think we're going to be looking at some type of a blended program if you're caught with having to have that 10 or 15 percent reduction. But I think you need to know how much. And each of these have different strategies. Cows leaving the farm, cows uh, not lactating, or cows setting in a lactation curve that I can't change anymore since we don't have BST available. So we'll stop there and turn it back to you, Corey. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. And uh as we move over to our next guest here, I'm a little jealous of Chris Wolf here. He's got a nice head of hair. His only liability is he's got to find a barber soon. But with a head like mine, I can get done in about two minutes with a big razor. But we're going to talk a little bit about variable and fixed costs, Chris. And one of the things, I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, and I confirmed it on the website, but the Restaurant Association estimates that eight million restaurant workers around the United States, that's about 80% of the restaurants are idle here. And, and that's part of that time horizon because it comes all the way back on the farm here. How long is this going to last and how do, how do you interact with those decisions that might take place? So Chris, go ahead. And I understand you're uh, coming in here today from just uh, north of East Lansing in the Michigan area. So welcome, Chris. Oh, <clears throat> thanks, Corey. Um, yeah. You know, there's a um, economist, uh, we think economics is useful um, and we use it all the time, but there are not that many things from economic theory that are actually particularly useful for day-to-day -day decision making a lot of times. But one of the concepts from economic theory that is useful that's come up in both some things that Jason has said and that Mike said is uh, kind of uh, variable and fixed cost. And that relates directly back to kind of the time horizon that we're talking about here. Um, so what economics says is you need to cover the variable cost of production. And in the long run, all costs of production are variable. So that means you got to cover them all. And in the short run, you produce where you at least have uh, your variable cost um, paid for, but you also have fixed costs, which are things that you can't change in the short run. So when you're thinking about this situation, part of what's important about this is um, what costs are fixed. For example, in the long run, you can change how much labor you hire, you can change your setup of your farm and things like that, but you might not be able to change the labor costs in the, sh in the short run in the length of time that we're talking about. So that's an important consideration for what your total costs are gonna do when you're making this decision. The other aspect is because of these base excess programs, if they've come in, they've changed the marginal revenue that you're getting, right, the price. And so that changes, um, how much of your variable costs you're covering or whether you're covering your variable costs and that changes a decision like on you know some cows that maybe were far out that were covering their variable costs um, now that there's this base excess program and if it lowers your your price there they're no longer covering the variable costs and they obviously become candidates to either be culled or to be dried off and so decisions like that are important and i think it's useful to think when you're working through this decision what does this do to my fixed 
versus a variable cost mixture. Uh, one of the things that makes farms profitable over time is, is asset turnover and using those assets effectively. And so you want to continue to use the assets effectively going forward. But clearly, with this uncertain time horizon, and as Mike pointed out multiple times, I thought very well, um, there's a real value on flexibility as far as when you're picking out what you might want to do. So thinking about strategies that are consistent with your long run goals of the farm, but also maintain some flexibility. And I guess the, the final thing I would say to start off with here, at least is um, the time horizon also affects kind of how big these market adjustment costs are gonna be, right? So um, this big kind of demand shock that we've had, this demand destruction, which has led to some of these base excess programs, um, how long that lasts is gonna be partly, um, well, you know, the market have, has an opinion on it, and I think Mark's gonna talk about this in a minute if you watch the futures market. Um, um, so the stock market has an opinion, the futures and options market has an opinion, but you have to make the best decision you can. But kind of the, the less that people adjust, the bigger the market adjustment costs are gonna be too. So there's some endogeneity in there, which makes this decision even more difficult and important for people to uh, do what Jason said and sharpen their pencils and look hard at the different options. Well, thank you, Chris. We'll turn it over to Mark Stevenson. Uh, late last Friday, we started, a, you and I started a conversation about uh, cheese blocks and barrels being about a dollar on the Chicago, uh, the CME. And in New Zealand, that price is about $2 for cheddar on the uh, dairy global dairy trade. So there's that issue going on. And uh, in the last 18 hours, President Trump invoked the product Defense Production Act, the Korean era, a Korean War era law here, that basically is ordering plants to reopen when it comes to processing meat here. Uh, right now, preliminary data shows that about 100,000 hogs are going unslaughtered this week. That's 20% of the U.S. total. Uh, beef is a little closer to 10%. But when you look at last uh, this past week to the same time last year, beef per production, what's going through the plants was off nearly 25%. So we got the cheese issue and we got the beef issue. Mark, with that in mind, that's a lot of stuff coming at you. Yeah. And you've done this uh, transfer as well as Monty Hall used to do when he would just simply say, now for something completely different. <laughs> So here we go. Um, yeah, last week we did get a question about this big spread in the uh, difference between the CME spot price at a buck a pound for a cheddar and the global dairy trade, which was at about roughly $2 per pound. That's a huge difference. We normally don't see anything like that at all. What are the explanations? Well, one of them is that the CME spot prices are the prices for today. They're for right now at this moment in time whereas global dairy trade prices are for delivery in the future, um, different time periods in the future, but in the future nonetheless. So um, we have to be aware of those differences. And you know, just to be fair for comparison, it's probably better to look at the CME futures prices for cheese uh, that correspond with roughly those delivery time periods for the uh, uh, global dairy trade contracts that you're looking at. And if you do, you would notice that maybe we're looking at more like $1.20 to $1.30 a pound for U.S. cheese prices that are expected. A couple observations out there. Um, the rest of the world has not been quite as desperate in terms of the impact on the dairy industry as the U.S. has been. And, you know, we've had some different reasons for that, I think, here. But to me, the uh, observation should be that I expect these prices to come together fairly rapidly. That with that kind of difference out here, we'd be happy to sell cheese overseas. And that trigger is going to get pulled pretty quickly. So there are going to be two things happen. One is that our cheese prices are going to come up and the world prices are going to come down and we'll meet or be close somewhere in the middle. So I think that should give us a little bit of optimism about uh, whether futures markets are prepared to incorporate those kind of concepts into their price forecasts, and I think they will. Um, so I would take that as a bit of optimism. Shifting gears um, to the meat processing, yes, Donald Trump uh, issued an executive order for the Defense Production Act to deem that packing plants 
our critical infrastructure. What does that mean? Well, that means that officially it assures that state and local officials can't shut down a packing plant if it's following the worker safety guidelines that have been issued by um, CDC and OSHA. So if they're following those guidelines, you can't come in and shut the plant down. They can stay open. Now, I think that's more permissive than it is thou mu shalt or thou, thou must uh, keep that plant open. But nevertheless, we've had a high rate of worker infection in those plants with uh, uh, the COVID virus. And we've had as many as 200 related deaths in those plants across the country. So um, I don't think it's surprising that those plants have needed to back up and re-examine what their uh, protocol is going to be. They're workers that are frightened to go back to work, honestly, in those plants. And last week, I had a little bit different information than you did, Corey, but it was about a third uh, less cattle and pork that I had seen that was being processed than we had seen uh, previously. So that's down quite a bit. In fact, there was a headline about 2 million chickens, I think, being euthanized. Um, so if this food can't get to con consumers, that's an issue. And if growers can't get animals to processing, um, that's an issue too. Uh, I'm not the uh, livestock or the dairy scientist, but nevertheless, uh, if we can't get our animals there, we can hold them for a period of time, but we can't hold them forever. So that's going to be a bit of a problem. And, you know, with, with those two things in mind, um, maybe we can take some questions. Thank you, Mark. And so a reminder to the audience here, we got almost 35 minutes for questions and there's a section on your go-to webinar control panel that uh, you can ask questions here. We got a number of them coming in already. And again, I'd like to thank Lalamad for sponsoring this week's broadcast. I'd certainly like to give shout outs to the people that you don't see on the screen here. Caitlin Allen, Maggie Gillis that are sorting through the questions here. Jim Baltz down in Urbana, Illinois, the same location as Mike being our production coordinator. <clears throat> I think this is a question, maybe we start with Jason and, and others that can add in here, but strategies to reduce a milk farm's milk supply may vary, again, based on the extent of this COVID-19 induced downturn here. And how might those strategies exist like a two to three month downturn versus six or even a year? So uh, what, what's your take on that one? Well, that's a, Good, very good question, Corey. And we have all these different strategies, and it's a uh, certainly handler specific on what they are allowing or not allowing. Because certainly, uh, is there a transfer of base? So that was one option not yet talked about. If a base can transfer between farms, that's another option in terms of acquiring base versus reducing production on our farm, but that's not necessarily an option for all handlers or all the reduction programs in place. And so when we think about the longer term, if it's a year or two years, now we're coming back to Chris's point about, well, all costs are eventually variable. It's just at what time frame. And with some of our things with the uncertainty, and it's how fast do we get to certain points? So what things do we start doing now from what Mike talked about to start cutting back production, reducing production, and what timelines of the T that Mike used to say, all right, how fast do I want to get there? Another use of that time. Do I want to be there by May 1st or do I want to be halfway there by May 30th and another quarter of the way there by June? And then if information changes by then, I can reassess and make additional changes and continue down the path of reduction or slow down the path or change direction. So that's that being nimble or that flexibility part because with all the uncertainty is how fast do we want to make the decision? And you can do the budgeting when you build your budgets or if you work with consultants in Excel, you can say, well, all right, what if I go this long versus this long? How may the numbers change for over that time frame? And once you start getting out past a year or two years, now there's a lot more speculation on what all the rest of the industry will do, but you can still at least use the same underlying assumptions and come up with a number for your farm. Of, all right, this would be the cumulative shortfall of cash or the, the cumulative new borrowings or the cumulative liquidity we'd have to come up with or whatever measures you want to use. 
I guess what I, I would add uh, to that, Jason, it is uh, being somewhat a, a risk of avoiding of, 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 of risk. I'd, I'd look trying to cover all my bases. In other words, uh, a, a culling. Uh, most farmers have five to ten percent cows that should be gone anyway, and so I, I'd pull that trigger right there. And uh, then I would be looking at uh, other strategies, maybe using that milk on the farm if I got enough bull calves and heifer calves and milk replacer things to cover some of the base there. And maybe look at some dry off uh, strategies as well. So uh, I, I think you got to spread your risk because I don't know, you know, if you, Jason, if you could tell me it'll be over in three months, uh, then I think we could really make a decision. But uh, yep, and that, that's certainly a very good point, Mike, because in some of the conversations here it's been well if this is a one month time frame we're doing nothing we'll just take a hit at zero on all that excess milk and we're not going to make any management changes but if it's three or four months now we're talking all right what can i use combination approach and i think most of the farms that have interacted with me that's what their feelings have been so far is they're going to be using a combination of things and then if it's it's a six month or 10 month or two years. Now, are they pulling those triggers more seriously or are they considering bigger changes? Well, you know, they, they call economics the dismal science. So I hate to step in and, and say this, but I'm going to anyway. And I'm, I'm expecting that Chris is going to be there and just back me up because I need that. <laughs> but uh, what, what I think the likelihood is here that we're first of all talking about how soon do we get past COVID? You know, how soon do we have testing available? How soon do we have um, immunizations available and are they effective? And can we get back to the way things used to be? We'll get back to something, but it's probably not going to be the way things used to be. Restaurants are not going to be as densely packed with people as they used to be. Um, some restaurants aren't going to make it through this. I think we'll be eating at home a little bit more. So don't expect to go back to precisely what we had before. It will be different. The other thing that I would say is that we are going to be in recession, as is the rest of the world, or at least much of the rest of the world. So think back now to 2009. One of the things that happened is that we were in recession, so was much of the rest of the world. And yet, curiously, um, the world looks at the U.S. as a, as a safe haven in, in these turbulent times. And so the value of the dollar rises in comparison to many other currencies, which means that our dairy products now look more expensive to the rest of the world than they do from other options. So I think that some of our exports are going to be a little bit slower coming back, too. Um, I think we should be preparing for this on the dairy farm for not a two month you know, impact. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be a six month or a one year, but I suspect it's gonna be closer to a one year uh, time frame that we're gonna claw our way back up. So what we're gonna do here, uh, we got questions coming in fast and furious. I think there's well over a dozen here on the screen. So we're gonna do a little bit of rapid fire here. And the first one is gonna go to Mike. Uh, when feeding milk to calves, can staff be passed to the whole herd? I think that risk is, is small. Obviously, the right answer is pasteurize the milk, but good luck on that. Um, I, I think that that risk is, is is there, but it's pretty small. So if if, I, if I'm going to be giving milk to calves, bull calves, uh, female calves, my milk cows, I think the risk of staph. Now, mycoplasma, another story, but the staph, I think, is small. And we'll stay with you here, Mike, on this one. We'll stay feeding here. If milk is added to the TMR, what is the risk of heating feed and causing spoilage? Yeah, a great, great point. The magic number, uh, one of my coworkers said, is 50 degrees. When it gets over 50 degrees, and we'll have that today in, in Illinois, the, the risk of putting that, that, that liquid milk, all that sugar in there, the risk of it going through a secondary fermentation is high. So the choices are to feed twice a day or three times a day, depending on whatever fits on the farm. Second of all, there is, an, you can put an acid in there that would retard uh, some of that heating, but that is a risk. And then of course, you've got to clean it out every day. And that milk's got to stay fresh. This is not liquid whey, this is milk. And so you've got to feed it as fresh. And if you can't feed it all up today, then it has to go uh, to an, another disposal method as far as that goes. Jason, uh, this one might be a little different, but maybe you've thought about it. Chris, this could be for you too. If we drop from 3X to 2X milking, can the Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, 
be used to compensate milkers losing milk hours on your farm? That's a very good question. I don't have an answer to that in terms of if that, how that money, if they stay on your payroll and you show that they're staying on the payroll, because from my understanding, as long as we can document that the money was used to be, or 75% of it was used for payroll expenses, employee legitimate expenses, then it would be forgivable at some point. So here's another one. Uh, this could be for Mark or Chris, I think. We didn't sign up for dairy margin coverage program in 2020. What's your thought process if we make it through? And should we sign up in 2021? What should we look at? Chris, why don't you have a whack at it? Uh, well, um, I think uh, the dairy margin coverage program is uh, something that you should always look at at that 950 level on the first 5 million pounds. So uh, I think it's pretty cheap protection at that level. Um, and, you know, um, so I think it's definitely something that should be considered in the future as your base of your risk management program. And then you can build off of that. Yeah, I would concur with that. Um, no different answer. Okay. This is kind of a bigger picture question here for our economists. Are we at risk of market deflation? And I think that question comes not only the dairy, but the, and you already alluded to it, deflation, recession, those are got a lot of commonality to them. Well, I think, you know, deflation would be the uh, loss of asset values. and. You know, that's one of the things we certainly do worry about or deflation is that's that's one um, observation I guess you could have with that um, we haven't seen much of that happening yet and I think the real question is do we get into panic selling do we start to lose farms um, rapidly and if that's the case then deflation's a possibility um, I did notice just the other day that at our auctions for um, sales of lactating animals or near lactating springers or even um, heifers uh, coming up that they've held up in value incredibly well during this time period when I would think they'd be among the most vulnerable. So those asset values haven't declined yet. Um, land, I don't think we have any real observations for that say that uh, those values have declined. That would be a big one to be concerned about. So Mike, we're gonna do a pair of them here for you. If milk is fed back to the herd, can we cut back on feeding protein? Oh, by, by all means, and, and that's an underlying uh, uh, assumption. If I'm feeding 16 pounds of uh, uh, fluid milk back to my cows, I'm gonna have the equivalent of about uh, six tenths of a pound of fat. And of course, we all know fat is fairly expensive ingredient in the feeding program. Uh, the protein, I'm gonna have about a half pound of protein I can replace. Uh, it's a different kind of protein, has a very degradable protein there. And then, of course, the sugar. And uh, I smile because uh, there's a Vermont dairyman who fed milk back to his cows. And guess what happened, guys and gals? The buggers came up and milked four pounds. Just, so, just what he didn't need was four more pounds of milk because he was feeding milk back to his cows. <laughs> because obviously, uh, there were the, the, either the, the protein form, the fat and or the sugar, it contributed there. So if you're going to put uh, whatever poundage you put in, if it's Holstein or Jersey or crossbred, whatever it is, you calculate how many, uh, what that is, put that in your ration balance or program, make sure you adjust for metabolizable protein. And uh, that's where I got those numbers I mentioned earlier, the feed value somewhere is close to $8 using some uh, curtain market values. Then the next question is, Mike, when discussing ration changes, what scares you about removing additives? Well, I, I think the additive is uh, that question came up from a, a coworker in California. He says, have you changed your list? And I think I've sharpened my list. Uh, transition cows really give me most bang for my dollar. So I'd be looking at maybe instead of feeding it for the entire lactation. And again, that's where that low group comes into play. Uh, I would be very comfortable taking out most of my atom, uh, additives, except maybe monensin uh, out, of, out of that group because uh, uh, I'm going to get better payback in the transition fresh cow or the lactation one. So my list has not changed. So my magic list is there. Uh, certainly an uh, additive like biotin increases milk production. You could think maybe that one might be on the cutting block. Uh, you don't need that milk there. But the other uh, the other additive list I have, I, I'd, keep them, I'd keep them in there, especially my transition cows. 
So uh, as we continue moving through the questions, we'll come to Jason here in a second. Um, we're pleased to have Lala Mayada as a sponsor. And Jason, you had some follow-up there. Sorry, to go ahead. Yeah, no, just Mike's very good point. That was one of the lessons that I can remember from 2009. And to Mark's point, well, it could be a year that we're clawing back from this and from terms of either the reduction programs or just the federal order prices and the futures prices and all that. And or 02 and 03, and certainly with some of the dairies that I've interacted with or participated in our research programs, the ones that did drastic changes or, or the comment that we've liked to use is pulled the carpet from underneath their herd that saved them costs in 09, but they missed 2010 because it took them all that time to get the ship righted, for lack of a better word, or to get the herd turned around. and. So again, we don't know how long this is going to be, and it's not, not gonna be a month, I think there's a lot of consensus on, but we always have to keep that in mind, is that if we pull the, herd, pull the carpet out from underneath the business, will, will, be, will we be able to capture or recover? And Jason, I add uh, to support you, I think uh, do no harm to my fresh cows and high producing cows, do no harm. Uh, they're very vulnerable. I got to get them pregnant. I've got to keep them in the herd. And so uh, do no harm when you start messing around with your rations as far as that goes there. And that's why I'm really nervous about backing nutrients down across the board. So there's a question here that was asked that I'll uh, answer, but there'll be a follow-up question. Some of our viewers asked, do we know how many dairy farms have shuttered since January? Now, the data that we get on that when report as an industry is generally for license uh, permits to sell milk from the pasteurized milk ordinance. Some states such as Wisconsin report that data monthly. The other smaller dairy states, you got a, it's kind of a yearly snapshot. Now we could go look into that, but I think the uh, follow-up question to that is, do you think COVID will accelerate a con consolidation or will it encourage supply control or what, what other outcome might come of this? It's a big picture question. If well, Andy was here, he'd say, turn the mic over to Mark, but. Uh. And I'm gonna say, since I'm senior, turn the mic over to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my initial reaction is it seems likely that, that these, uh, what's going on now will um, everything else equal accelerate uh, structural change consolidation um but it kind of depends on what happens with government aid and how it gets targeted and how it gets uh, um, dispensed jason this question is going to come to you you talked about it in the opening here and this is a uh, talk about a pencil sharpening question what would be an appropriate amount to pay for purchasing another farm's base? And then we're talking about base at a co-op and you're smiling already because that's a deep question. But go ahead and at least go through the thought process. I'm sure they're looking for a number, but that's not happening here. Yeah, there, there, there is no number because every farm's dependent and, and the thought process coming again from the budgeting or the financial decision making is, okay, this is what my scenario looks like if I, don't buy the base and I have to reduce base and I do the changes Mike talks about, I do the various things and all right, this is what my scenario looks like. And then if I don't have to do all that and I can still produce at my 100% of output or whatever that number may be, all right, now what does that scenario look like? And then you can decide what time frame you wanna look at. Is it over four months? Is it over six months? Is it over the rest of the year? Is it over 12 months? and put your assumptions in there and then all right what's the difference between those two scenarios and that starts giving us a guideline to say all right you could spend a, a, this total amount of money to potentially acquire base and then it's like well all right how much do i want to take the risk and what other assumptions if they pay me zero for 12 months or do they pay me seven dollars for part of that time frame or those types of things. So, and that's where the budgeting comes into play. So I don't think there's any set number. And uh, the few farms that have shared things with me that have at least thought about this, it's like, okay, it's a very farm dependent on what strategies they're having for their farm and what the differences are between the different scenarios. 
So Jason, let me challenge you with a question. If, if, our, if our break even is $17 milk, that's a common number used here in Illinois, and yep. I'm gonna get 14, what, 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 does that change our answer at all? What, what, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I lose well, milk, yep. 300 pounds I ship. Yeah, it, for the next period of time. Yep, and there's probably nothing we can do, on Mike, in the next six months to change your cost structure from 17 to 14. Right. And depending on what decisions we make, we might actually change our cost from 17 to 17.50, and we're still getting $14. So the question becomes, well, if I'm only getting 17 on 100% of my milk, but then if I'm getting 17.50, or I get 16.50 because of X amount of milk, I'm getting zero for, all right, now what's my additional loss? depending on what management changes I make to minimize that loss. Because that's so a, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna change to a new, another question here. So if you got something, Jason, go ahead. No, All I right. mean, it's back to, back to some of Chris's comments about the variable versus, versus fixed costs. So here's a markets question, and I'm talking dairy product market. Is it more likely that lack of exports is more responsible for the excess milk rather than restaurant closures? And I would say the opening answer to that, they're both contributing. But what are you seeing out there, Mark, Chris? Yeah, they're, they're certainly both contributing. Um, you know, when we take a look at just the uh, domestic loss of, um, of sales, you know, the, I've had people ask me, well, why are sales down? I mean, we're still eating, right? But it's a matter of what we're eating. Uh, the density of dairy products used in out-of-home eating is greater than the density of dairy products used in in-home cooking. Uh, we simply don't cook at home the same way that chefs cook for us in out-of-home eating. So there is some loss there, but that doesn't account for this common number that's thrown around that we need to reduce our milk supply by 10%. You have to look at the export markets and we've certainly lost export sales. Um, if you look at the value of the peso, it's down by um, something like 25% uh, in comparison to the US dollar. So there's been a big change there. Mexico's our biggest customer. Uh, we've lost export sales to Mexico as a result of that. That's balanced a little bit with the relatively lower dairy product prices that we have here, but export sales are down, and we don't have all the data yet to be able to make the declaration, I guess, that you're asking for. But if I had to guess, I would say export sales are at least as important to explaining um, this need to reduce the milk supply as domestic sale loss is. So, Mike, we're going to come back to you here on this question. If rations are changed to reduce production, how hard is it to bring back that production later on? Well, if you believe the data coming from Israel, it says once you're out about 60 to 80 days, you've now set the lactation curve, and you will not turn that curve around until, as Jason said, for another lactation. So you're pretty well stuck. And that's why I'm saying do not damage my uh, my my early lactation cows and my high cows because I, I can't bring them back. What about those mid -lac late lactation cows? Yes, I'm going to lose some milk there, but I'm counting on that milk to uh, uh, to meet, meet meet my my deduction or quota or whatever number or uh, amount assigned milk as far as that goes. So uh, that's why I would not mess with my high string. So here's a pair of questions we covered in the. Uh dairy live stream here two weeks ago, but I'm going to ask him just in case there's anything that uh, any one of our commentators want to ask here, and I'd encourage viewers to go back and watch that dairy live stream, but have you heard co-ops are planning, how are co-ops planning to cover dumped milk within their patrons? So there's that topic, and then um, what recommendations do you have to document dumped milk if our co-op is requiring us to for example, we cannot claim these lost pounds on DMC or DRP, yet we have to pay the full premium. I don't know that that's true, but any uh, one want to tackle that? And I know I see some heads turning there. Well, with respect to the DRP and DMC, um, they made um, allowances in DRP for the dumping milk explicitly, and and you 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 could mark it up to. 
uh, fifteen percent less under the that you that you covered under DRP to begin with. And I believe, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that they made um, an allowance for um, dumped milk explicitly in DRP. And and DMC is actually tied to your uh, historical milk production. So it, um, as long as you've uh, shipped milk during this year, you're you're going to be fine for coverage on DMC. Um, Mark, please correct me if I'm got that wrong. No, that's that's correct. I mean, um, DMC is based on your historic production. So if you're shipping milk at all, you're still eligible to receive, you know, the payments based on historic production. Doesn't really matter what uh, current production is as long as it's not zero. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the other thing that I would just throw in here, I have no idea how the rules are going to play out when we get to some of these direct payments to dairy producers or to livestock production or anything else. But when we start hearing about milk being dumped um, or whether we start hearing about animals needing to be euthanized because we can't get them into and through, um, you know, the uh, livestock uh, production, then I think we need to make sure that we try to document that to the extent that we can whether that's having a veterinarian come out and say, yep, you've got these animals, whether that's taking a picture of the, you know, bulk tank uh, dipstick on there that gives you a time and location stamp and just says on this day, this tank was full this much. Um, then at least we have a track record for how much we produced, even though we couldn't sell it um, so that we can receive payments for whatever compensation is going to be there. So we're going to do a couple questions here, a uh, little bit rapid fire here, and I'll even take a couple of them. Um, what? Well, first off, we you know we talked through the program that USDA is going to roll out last week, and uh, the question is: Are dairy protection program payments delayed? What might be we expect another payment? Now that program details are going to be worked out here in May, and then payments probably in June. We still got a lot to learn about that, so we'll be covering that in a future dairy live stream, and I'm getting nodded yeses for that one. Um, then there's another question, is there any discussion about production reduction incentive programs being rolled out in the future? And at this point, the private sector, the industry, the co-ops, and the processors have done that, and it's been pretty abundantly clear that the USDA and the Secretary of Agriculture has no uh, interest right now in putting that into uh, government rules and I'm getting answer, uh, nodding yes on that one. Then the uh, third question here is this, uh, what retail, will retail milk prices drop as farm gate prices go down? And to set that up a little bit here, so obviously milk prices have gone down at the farm, but you have all these things to get to the grocery store here. And can a manufacturer get enough cardboard to put butter in, in containers and those kind of things. And as that is delayed, I, I've heard that in Costco out in uh, California, they're, they're struggling to get American butter because little components of supply chain are not being fulfilled here. But talk through that a little bit as well. Chris, you want to ask? No Go ahead, Mark. I'm, I'm passing that one to you, Mark. <laughs> OK, fine. Um, we have had um, certainly some constrictions along the supply chain. Um, I mean, a lot of this is getting pushed back to, to farms, you know, to reduce production here. But as soon as we have the opportunities to get those products into retail stores, we're certainly trying to do it. Packaging, curiously enough, has been a restriction. Um, one of the comments that was made uh, by a couple of our guests last week was that uh, We've got an entire supply chain from the farm all the way up to retail that's relying on just-in-time inventory. And when you're switching a number of um, things that are, that are occurring along that supply chain rapidly, we may not have all the capacity we need. So whether it's blow molds, you know, that can uh, make half-gallon jugs fast enough, um, that can be a constriction. Whether we have paperboard available um, to fill cartons, that may be a constriction along that supply chain. Um, but we're rapidly getting to the point where that's not. I mean, the industry has done, I think, a tremendous job in trying to, to change what normal production patterns have been to something that's really quite new and different. 
So we're getting those kinks worked out, but it will take some time. I do think that maybe going forward, we're going to have a lot of the supply chain that asks, should we have all the efficiencies that we get from just-in-time inventory, or should we buffer some of our risk that's available by having capacity to do a few other things? Um, it's going to add a little bit of cost to a system, but maybe that um, – maybe that uh, risk is going to be worth uh, avoiding or, or making sure we've got the capacity to handle it. So in the countryside, I know we can see some data here and the data will be coming in here. And again, data has been uh, in this time is really changing, but has dairy cow culling ramped up here recently? What, what have you been seeing? Yeah, so, we've had we have had some uh, you know culling increases uh, recently for sure. Um, I don't know what the net has been you know relative to the replacement animals coming in, but culling has picked up a little bit. Um, again, part of that is what's the opportunity for me to cull animals if I want to versus um, you know what are the uh, you know what what's my desire to cull at this point in time. You know, this is a follow-up here, and, and, you know, we can go through scenarios as an industry and until a COVID-19 hits. You don't know how all these puzzle pieces are going to fit together. But this is a follow-up to our discussion on cheese prices. If U.S. cheese prices are so much cheaper than New Zealand and the world, why are exports higher? And this is a logistic thing. It's containers. It's shipping. It's port of entry. And uh, talk through that a little bit more. Well, there's a lot of things that have to happen. I, I do know that um, if you are going to try to export or have an export sale, um, then you've got to think about all of those pieces. And one of the things you want to make sure is that this price difference, your competitive advantage at this point in time, is going to hold up long enough from the point in time that I make this decision to the point in time it's delivered, right? So um, I'm not going to put this stuff on a ship for a couple of weeks if I don't think that this product price difference is going to hold up or I can consummate that sale. So that's one of them. The other thing is that we've had um, ships that have been stuck in ports for a period of time. We haven't gotten all the containers back here to this country that can be filled up and move in, in those directions. And, uh, you know, there's just been a, a big disruption all the way through. Um, COVID-19 has been a huge rock that got dropped in the pond. It's creating more than small ripples. So here's a final question here that we're going to do on our dairy live stream sponsored by Lalamad here. And I think everyone can comment on this one. And, you know, one of the biggest things we need on our farms and in the industry is talent. What will be the impact our dairy industry will face if schools and colleges are delayed through into 2021? How do we get education done and get people out performing in the field? Have you had well, a talk? Well, well, I'll, I'll start at least from the, the applied extension side and certainly from our extension is what, what are we doing for more, more online based, uh, Zoom based, small group meetings, uh, online programs, online courses, the webinars, uh, any of those types of things just to say, all right, we're not going to be able to do out in the field programs in the same manner that we were before. And who knows when we'll be allowed to do that again. So how can we develop those programs that will be a, be a step in at least and maybe have some fit longer term, but at least seeing we can't do on farm work, what can we be doing to still work with groups of farms or groups of employees in terms of a bunch of our different extension employees for training programs, just all moving to an online based and all right, telling our farms to actually build an online studio on their farm and an online teaching station on their farm in terms of the right computer with cameras, sound, soundproofing, or a quieter location and those types of things so that we, so it can be more effective for employees too. I'll leave it to Chris or Mark or Mike on the college side and the high school side and the 
Well, you know what? I would say um, my experience has been that um, there's a lot of uh, good employment opportunities in U.S. agriculture before this happened. Um, it's always been the case, it seems like to me, that I've been talking to agribusiness firms that are always looking, and there's um, good jobs to be had there. I think that we'll go back to that in the future. I, I don't know what kind of hybrid system we'll do to get the students educated until we can get back to more in normal. Normal. I tell you what, I can't wait to get back to in-person classes. I'm sick of teaching them online, and I'm sure they're sick of seeing me online. Um, but the other thing I would say is um, this whole situation is probably going to change some of the things that we teach the students too. Like Mark was talking about the uh, supply chains and the value of redundancy and resiliency and risk management that way. And I think that's definitely going to affect some of the things that we're going to be teaching them about management also. Yeah, my, only, my only comment would be is that we're, lessons are being learned, both in terms of uh, delivery of students, uh, d uh, classes, uh, athletics, everything. Uh, and I think you're going to see some some long term. I, I think this this supply management thing is is going to be with us for a while, maybe eventually long term. Uh, that we're only going to produce the amount of milk we can actually sell. Yeah, and quite literally, ten minutes before we got on the webinar here, I wrapped up uh, an online class. You know that I was teaching today, and I think that those have worked better than I expected for the most part. Oh, it's going to be a little tougher to teach something like palpation or skills, you know, that students are going to need to learn online. Um, but there are some classes that are very amenable to it. And and uh, we, we can transfer quite a bit of education this way. And I think that we're going to find that, in fact, it, it works well. And uh, as we get better at doing it and folks get better at receiving it, all to the good. And to Jason's point, I have heard more discussion about how do we improve rural broadband so that folks can receive this kind of education better than they do now. Uh, they don't have to go to McDonald's, you know, to uh, um, do their, <laughs> their elementary school courses that way, uh, that type of thing. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it'll be some combination, but I don't think normal looks like it did in the past as we go ahead. Well, thank you, Mike and Jason and Chris and Mark. This uh, program was sponsored by Lalamad. And next, join us next Wednesday, May 6, 2020, for our program. We will The conversation will continue. Our sponsor will be Protecta, and we're glad to have them part here. And so this webinar will be archived here uh, within the next 24 hours and will be found on our website, www.hordes.com. We have that all coalesced in one place there under Dairy Livestream. And with that, that concludes our broadcast. And again, this is Corey Geiger, uh, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairyman, and I bid you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you.